We run into problems because most of our time is actually spent for practical reasons in the lab analyzing our data. So we spend much less time at sea than we should, and we're not able to capture variation over time. So what we really need is a sea telescope, something that's on all the time, generating data all the time, and something that we can monitor all the time. So fortunately, in the late 90s, some senior scientists uh, in Washington State and here in British Columbia started to conceive of this idea. They realized that there were some problems with their traditional sampling. And they sort of mapped out this notion that, well, perhaps we could take some instruments and we could put them in different environments on the sea floor and we could connect them to the internet. And we can have all this data rolling in and we can make this data freely available to everyone. And over the next 10 years or so, this sort of idea became, this informal sort of idea became a reality. And so today we have perhaps the largest and longest running uh, ocean observ observation network in the world, and it's situated in waters around Vancouver Island. So we have the Venus network, which is situated in the Strait of Georgia and Sandwich Inlet, and we also have a much larger Neptune network extending from the west coast of the island off into the deep ocean. So this system basically consists of a suite of instruments, hundreds of instruments, connected to fiber optic cables. And these fiber optic cables power the instruments, and they also allow us to send information back from these instruments via the internet to a suite of users. So these are scientists and academics and the public at large. And we have instruments like video cameras. They're constantly capturing images. We have, we have instruments that measure currents. We also have hydrophone arrays that can capture uh, the sonic signatures of whales as they pass by, so we can get a sense of where they are and where, when they come past our area. We have autonomous devices that we can control remotely from land, so we can ask these devices to go out and collect samples from different areas. And all of these instruments together form part of a long-term time series. So the intended lifespan of this observatory is about 25 years. So it's important to note that we started off with an issue with time, that we weren't out there sampling often enough in time, so we had no resolution with time. Now we're faced with sort of the opposite problem. We've entered into an age of big data, where we're, some of our instruments are sending back information on the scale of several thousand times a second. And using our traditional sort of analytical tools, it becomes really difficult to deal with this sort of data, or we have to start thinking about data very differently. And a really good example is a longer time series we have of these animals, which are krill, which are small crustaceans. And they're really important. They serve as a, a major food item for small fish, like herring. You might see the occasional one going through the, <laughs> the swarm there. Um, what's really interesting about these animals is that they need to feed at the surface, um, but they need to avoid their predators at the same time. So they tend to stay in the deep, deeper, darker waters at night, or so during the daytime, and only migrate up to the surface when there's no light during the daytime. And you can get at this by taking your ship out and sampling several times over the course of the day, and you'll get this coarse sort of sense of this pattern. But we have autonomous instruments, uh, like echo sounders, for instance, that make measurements every two seconds. And you can see this nice trace uh, of these animals going up right at sunset, staying at the surface and feeding, and then coming down at sunrise. And just to put this into context in terms of data, we might collect several net casts and get a sense of this, or we might make measurements every two seconds like this. And so we're making measurements every two seconds over the course of 24 hours. That turns into a lot of data. And so we have to start thinking about how to visualize this data differently and how to analyze it differently. So one approach researchers at our organization have taken on is to look at things in terms of a data cube. And what they've done is effectively taken that 24-hour um, image and pasted them together for the course of six months in this instance. And so this gives you an idea of how uh, the zooplankton vary in time over a day, but also seasonally, which is really cool. But bear in mind that our time series is already seven years long. So this cube would actually extend way beyond uh, this screen, in fact. So we have to start thinking of even of other approaches to deal with this data and with this amount of data in a timely sort of fashion. So this is one thing we have at Ocean Networks Canada, which is this thing called digital fissures, and it's this interactive approach to dealing with our video data. We have thousands of hours of video data, and what this allows users to do, anybody on the internet, is to select different features that they see on the video. So what kind of seafloor are you looking at? Is it flat? Is it cobbled? What kind of sea life do you see? Anemones, crabs, fish? And you start making these notations, and 
if we have enough people online using this video, we can condense the time it takes. It's effectively crowdsourcing, right? We can basically reduce the time it takes to analyze this data. A single researcher might take years to get through thousands of hours of data. So now I'm gonna sort of talk about time in a slightly different way, and that's in the context of prediction. So we have uh, instruments on, the, on some of the BC ferries that cross the Strait of Georgia every, every day several times. And these instruments have been on there for years, but what we've done is connect these instruments to the internet. So the data is available in high res in real time. And we're really interested in developing nice high resolution data sets for the Strait of Georgia because we can use this information to develop predictive models. And these models are especially useful to look down the road to see how do conditions in the Strait change so we can predict the return, for instance, of salmon, which is really important to the local economy. And so here you can see this ferry making a nice track through the Fraser River plume. And you can tell it's going through the plume because you can see this discolored water, which is all the silt that the, the river's bringing out. And we can look at the same picture in the context of what the instruments are measuring. And here's a picture of the ferry route from Duke Point on the island to Vancouver. And as the ferry crosses, it goes through really saline water, which is the red color, and into the Fraser River plume. And you can see the lighter colors there. So this is really nice data that's resolved both in time and in space. If we want, we can start to paste this data together on a daily basis and get a really rich sort of sense of what's going on. And here's just 30 days of data. And you can see, hopefully, quite clearly, as you move from left to right, that the Fraser River uh, plume is expanding and then contracting and then expanding. So again, we can use this high-res data from a suite of instruments that we have on the ferry to start to predict events in a few weeks' time, in a few months' time, and hopefully in a few years' time. So what happens when we need to know um, not what's happening necessarily, we need to predict what's happening not necessarily in a month or a year, but what's gonna happen in seconds. So here's an example of where this would come really handy. This is a picture of the tsunami that hit the coast of Japan in March of 2011 following a, a major, major earthquake. And this earthquake and tsunami caused uh, quite a bit of devastation and there's a dramatic loss of life. But it's widely acknowledged that that loss of life and destruction would have been far more had it not been for an array of seismometers situated along the coast. And the, the array of seismometers allowed scientists to inform the authorities of an impending earthquake within a minute or so. And that one minute was crucial in turning off um, some of the major infrastructure. We have a similar situation here and we should expect a similar earthquake sometime in the future. Fortuitously, we have uh, our infrastructure situ uh, situated throughout the subduction fault zone. And so we can ostensibly provide a warning of 30 seconds or so to uh, the infrastructure uh, in Victoria or Vancouver, which would hopefully save some lives. Tsunamis tend to propagate at a slower rate um, within an hour or so, and we have bottom sea pressure, uh, sea pressure um, sensors that allow us to get a sense of the magnitude of the tsunami and the direction it's gonna take. So we can predict within an hour or so the path and inform people living the path of the tsunamis that perhaps they should evacuate. And again, hopefully mitigate any major loss of life. So I'm just gonna wrap things up, say I brought up this idea of a city telescope and that it's, it's actually a real idea. And it comes with some challenges with respect to how to deal with data, how to deal with time, but it also comes with some real advantages um, and real uh, important applications. And so I'll just leave you with a sort of invitation to go and visit our, our website, oceannetworks.ca, and get online and make your own, participate in ocean observation. Thank you. Thank you.